Thank, thanks for inviting me here today. Uh, so Frank asked me, he said, Mike, I want you to give five minutes uh, talking about the record to date in defeating uh, radical Islamic terrorism. I told him I that didn't need five minutes. That'd be a that'd be a, a thirty second a thirty second accounting. Uh, th thanks thanks for the time. Uh, you know, two two recent events that kind of stand uh, stand out uh, to me. So we had uh, a leader at Al Azhar and then a leader at the prayer breakfast. And I want to I want to give you a couple of things that were said. And you tell me which place you think they may have been said and by whom. Um, one of the national leaders urged Muslim clerics to re-examine their religious teachings. He said it was not merely an extremist interpretation of Islam threatening the world, but rather ideas at the core of mainstream orthodox understanding of that religion, and that a religious revolution uh, would be required to change. He said that Islam, as is being taught and practiced by leading religious scholars, has given birth to a globally destructive ideology, which is now threatening all of us. Uh, that, of course, was the Egyptian president, not our own. Uh, our president had a very different view. He had a view of it as a series of random acts of violence, uh, a, a series of disconnected dots along the continuum. And you've heard from others this morning uh, what that means. It means a failed American response to the very real threat to us here in the United States uh, from radical Islamic terrorism. You know, I, I, I could recount this failed record. I, I can talk about the failed understanding. I'll, I'll do that a little bit. Uh, Benghazi, perhaps, is a good perspective with which may, with, from which uh, I can use my time here this morning to talk to you about how these manifest themselves. Uh, so there's lots of focus about the events on the ground that evening, uh, about talking points, and these things all have relevance and salience for sure. But we have to remember how we got there and what it was a greater part of and why it was that the administration refused to acknowledge what really happened that night. It is, uh, it is symptomatic of what the speakers before me spoke to. Uh, it, it is symptomatic of a failure to recognize that what happened that night was an act of radical Islamic terrorism uh, perpetrated by jihadis, in this case uh, lots of groups including Ansar al-Sharia, um, but perpetrated by uh, men with the intention of expanding the caliphate and expanding uh, the scope of Sharia law around the globe. This is, this is what happened that night and this is an administration to this day that has not come to terms with what took place. Rather, the response to date has been uh, uh, the plucking of one individual, Abu Qatala, from uh, Libyan shores, bringing him back and putting him in federal prison not far from where we sit today. Uh, we know where there were dozens of uh, people who killed four Americans that evening, yet we refused to do the right thing and do the intelligence work that is required and associated with what we could garner from that evening. And I mention that because we can all cite particular cases. To, you know, we, we are bailing out of Sana'a even as we speak. Uh, and yet this is a president who said that Yemen was his, one of his greatest counterterrorism successes. We can, we can go through this list. What, what you see is a, a failure of uh, understanding, a refusal to acknowledge uh, the real threat and its connectedness. I, uh, I, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd end my remarks by talking about um, this president's absence of willingness on the ground. We can, we can talk a lot about the president's strategy. Um, but look at the tactics that he is, is selecting. Look at the tools that he is demanding Congress take away from him. Uh, Guantanamo Bay, right, an enormous intelligence collection asset, one that has proven very important uh, for us knowing about these jihadis as they move around the world. He'd, he'd like to close it. Uh, Guantanamo should be open and full. Uh, we, um, we, we watched this morning him present an authorization for the use of military force. I sat with White House lawyer last evening, and what the president is asking Congress to do is absolutely unheard of. This president is asking for Congress to restrict his authorities. It, it, it is truly remarkable to watch as they try and limit themselves. Uh, they are walking away from the threat that we all are talking about this morning. Uh, they want nothing to do with it. Uh, they don't view it as serious. The president says, uh, went to West Point, my alma mater. He's been there twice. It's deeply disturbing. Uh, yeah, the first time he went there, he went to tell the cadets that we were going to depart Afghanistan on timeline as uh, scheduled, and he uh, identified for the enemy precisely how many troops on precisely which day they would depart. On his second trip, he went to graduation. You can imagine, right? Some of you have seen this, 22-year-old men and women sitting on my, at Mikey Stadium. The president's coming. It's a big day. Their parents are in the stand. These are warriors. These are young men who have chosen to sacrifice themselves to go defend American freedom. 
and he told them that the biggest threat to America that they would face in their lifetime was global climate change. <coughs> uh, sometimes cadets can be unreal. You can imagine the silence that day. Uh, it's funny at one level, but it is more importantly deeply dangerous. Uh, a commander in chief, a president, a nation that is unprepared to defend itself against the threat of the magnitude that the global jihadis present to us today uh, is disturbing and dangerous. And I am so glad you held this conference, Frank, uh, so that we can talk about it and identify and begin to develop the solutions which will ultimately defeat, uh, defeat them in detail.